Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. I think we had a small audio issue there. Thank you very much for joining us. If this is your first time joining us on Nature Live, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what it's all about. Nature Live normally takes place in our studio at the Natural History Museum in London, but we've not been able to run the show there for a little while now due to recent events. So we've decided to bring the show online direct to you at home. Now, usually we've got one of our scientists that joins us and they uh, talk about the collections and their research at the museum. But today it's a little bit different. We've got a very special guest joining us in the form of one of our photographers that features in this year's Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. Uh, every year there's stunning imagery uh, that impresses the judges and uh, it never disappoints. And today I'm really pleased to be joined by one of our photographers, Matt Moran, who's come along to talk about one of his images that features in the exhibition this year but of course, to talk a bit more about his life as a photographer, and we're gonna be exploring lots of different images from his portfolio. So if you've got any questions at all today, uh, either about the images that we're looking at, or if you're a budding photographer and you'd like some hints, tips and advice, then please uh, just get in touch in the chat and we will do our very best to get through as many questions as we can. But uh, let me introduce you now to Matt. Matt, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, how are you today? Very well, thanks. I excited to be here and always impressed at the resilience of, uh, well, everyone keeping things going online. So um, yeah, congratulations for still <laughs> managing to pull it off. No, it, it's really great. And, um, you know, in some ways, it's great that we can bring bring our conversations to more people by by bringing them online. So thanks very much for, for coming along, giving up your time today to talk to us. Pleasure. Um, so before we start looking at some of your images, we've got, um, uh, we've. I really want to kind of find out a bit more about, you know, what do you do you're a wildlife photographer you know what do you do day to day in that are you are you going out in the field every day and just and snapping pictures or is, or is there a bit more to it <laughs> yeah i think a lot of people think uh, being a wildlife photographer is a, a glamorous life and i'm not going to deny you know over the last 20 years how long i've been doing it i've seen some amazing sites been to some amazing national parks and, and wilderness areas and um you know that is, is is unforgettable i feel very privileged and fortunate to to have traveled so much throughout my 20s and, and 30s but you know nowadays my photography is getting closer and closer to home um bar a trip to vietnam last year almost all my photography has been in the uk um so yeah the 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 well the, the i think nature photographers these days are, are not just photographers you know we are public speakers um we are publishers we have agencies we have galleries um we run workshops it's probably the biggest source of income certainly with my peers i run workshops as well um and then we spend a lot of time i think like most jobs in in front of a computer and that's trying to get sources of funding it's um, responding to emails it's processing and editing work it's putting short films together which is something i do quite a lot and really enjoy doing so um but i'm definitely most happy when i'm in the field with my camera trying to capture you know great pictures of, of wildlife yeah, I can imagine that's that's really what you, what you want to do, and uh, is to be there close to the animals and and getting those those winning shots that uh, <laughs> that you that you're after. And speaking of of winning shots, um, one of your uh, images has made it into the uh, Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. Um, it's a striking image, and I thought let's let's have a look at it now, and, and maybe you can talk us through um, how you got how you got this shot and 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 what why it's so special to you. So. The first thing that I have to say when I see this that really strikes me is that is an enormous rat in that <laughs> pocket mouth. I know it's. Uh, I, I I didn't really appreciate how big the rat was until I got back home and was trawling through the thousands of pictures I took in this short period of time of amazing action. Um, I mean, the 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 answer to getting a picture like this, I, in in a way, is quite simple. You know, I'm not going to say it's easy. It, it, but you know you need to know what you're doing technically with the with with the camera so that when a situation like this does come up you can execute it without making any technical mistakes which is a, a, a real challenge but the simple part of it is just going to one location over and over and over again which i've been doing for the past four years photographing these foxes that are just 10 minutes walk from my house so i've given myself and this was you know before the pandemic started i started this back in at the end of 2016 this project um and you know i'm able to walk to this location which is 
I'm perfect. And so I'm giving myself you know, the best, you know, I'm, I'm making it accessible. Um, and, you know, the more you go back to a location and as your portfolio starts to build, uh, the more picky you get about pictures and, and you know, you, as a photographer, a wildlife photographer photographing animals, really you're always looking for behavior. That's what makes the most in interesting shots. Um, you know, portraits are really nice, but behavior is what really captures people's imaginations. And I think when you're trying to tell stories with a picture, which is ultim ultimately what I'm doing with this Fox work, um, you know, these kind of images are, are, are what you're, you know, dreaming about and, and, and hoping about getting some you know, brilliant interaction. There's life and death situations going on. There's power play between the two foxes. You know, I know, I know them well. This is the, the one with the rat in her mouth is a, a vixen. Uh, and she's, um, she's now three years old. And the fox coming into the left of the frame is her younger brother was a, was a litter from last year. And both of these foxes, extraordinarily, are, are um, the son and daughter of this one vixen that I've been photographing the whole time I've, I've been there. And urban foxes, I don't know if you know, but their average lifespan in the city is only 18 months. Sadly, most get hit by cars. Psychoptic mm. mange is still a big issue. Um, so it's, it's amazing. And she's still alive today. Uh, I just saw her last week and I mean, it'd be amazing if she had a fifth round of cubs, but she's a bit of a super fox. And so it's nice to be able to also learn about the family structures. And, you know, I don't watch EastEnders at home. You know, my soap opera is on the allotment with all these foxes. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it's uh, just as uh, dramatic with as many twists and turns uh, on the allotment there. Um, so, you know, obviously when you, you know, you've said you've been you've actually been photographing these foxes for many years now, um, you know, and as you say, you, you start to get really picky about the kind of shots that you're getting. And, you know, when you've got a competition like Wildlife Photographer of the Year and you want to enter a picture into it, you know, photographers go through their portfolios, they're looking at the images they've got and they're trying to pick out the one that they think, I think this is this is a, a strong image that's got a really good chance in, in the competition. What was it about this image in particular that said to you, I think this has got a chance? Because the judges, uh, they rated this as a, a highly commended image. So they, they clearly, they saw something in it. What did you see in it that you thought, I'm going to enter this one? Um, it's a great question. I think it's, you know, I've, I've been entering the competition for, for 18 years and, you know, I've been had rejection of rejection after rejection and then two years ago I, I, I was fortunate enough to have something in the people's choice award also of, of fox and so obviously over that time i've improved as a photographer but one of the things i think in learning about what makes an image an award-winning image in the wildlife photographer of the year is you know i was getting stuff into the final stages but never made it into the exhibition. And then when I went to the exhibition to, to view those pictures, I would see, you know, that that level was just that little bit higher. You know, that bit of behavior was just that, you know, more exceptional. And that moment was just caught brilliantly by the photographer. And now more days you see incredible technical feats, you know, going on with um, camera traps and, you know, beautifully lit pictures. And you just think, well, what will it take to get something in this competition? Yeah. Well, I think, I think I feel that as you know, I'm not a photographer, at least not a professional photographer, anyway. So I, I think that. But to hear that from someone like yourself as well, who who does this for a living, just shows like <laughs> it, it's, people. It's really you can really impress folk with <laughs> some great shots. That's right, and I think there are there are there were probably you know hundreds more pictures out of the fifty thousand that they get every year that that would make up probably an equally as good exhibition. Uh, and then it, on the day, I guess it just depends who the judges are, what their background is. That's why it's so subjective. And I think that's why, you know, anyone watching this who wants to try and get an image in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year is if you're photographing, don't photograph for a competition. You know, do your mm. own project, do something else um, and spend your time focusing on that and look at competitions as something as a side gig because, you're always going to be disappointed. And I, obviously I say that from a, a, a hugely privileged position now, having had two images in in the last three years, but I've also had 18 years of, of rejection. And I think in the beginning I was like, oh, I've, I've got, you know, it was the holy grail. You've got to get something in the wildlife photographer of the year. But actually if you focus on a project and then get 
and something that you think is good enough. And you know, going back to your question with this picture, I thought definitely it's good enough um, to to get in there. And I think what made this picture so powerful was the intensity between the two foxes. You know, this fox, this this male cub. Well, it was it was a fully grown by then. This was taken in September last year. Was stalking into the frame the 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 vixen you know that had hold of the rat at that time because they were they were taking turns and sometimes they would drop it and get bored and another one would go and pick it up and then the fight would would start again and they were growling tossing it in the air and you know really behaving like a cat would in fact someone mm. told me this here this brilliant thing about foxes and um, they said that foxes are like um, i have to get this right they're like dog hardware run on cat software <laughs> And I just thought that's a brilliant like description because they look like dogs. I mean, you know, they're canids, um, but they really behave like cats. You know, the way they walk across tops of fences, they they're, they're very quiet um, when they're jumping around, very very agile. And and with this, the way they were tossing this this rat around, um, you know, the position of the rat was perfect. You know, slunked over in the jaws of this fox, the intense stare. The balance of it was just right you know the image before this that fox on the left was just too far out of the frame the image after it it was covering the fox's face so mm. you're relying also a little bit on the technology of the camera that shoots seven frames a second to capture that that moment that, that perfect moment yeah so it does seem just looking at it now the way that the you know the the, the fox that's approaching uh nearest the camera you can see it, it sort of frames the the other fox and the the rat so nicely that the, the ear and the side of the fox because coming down it, it it really does work i can completely imagine how a fraction of a second earlier or later and it doesn't work that's yeah that's absolutely right i think that the out of focus fox forces your eye to where the focus point is you know right over that fox's face with the rat in its mouth and and you get that natural shallow depth of field mm -hmm. using a, a long lens this was a 70 to 200 lens and i think it was at its maximum at, at 200 so you, you've got that lovely soft background which you naturally get with telephoto lenses to help um your subject to really stand out so yeah th there is also luck involved you know the, mm. the the fact that that fox was creeping in on the left hand side i didn't see that because you've got your eye right up to the viewfinder and you just i was just focusing on the fox with the rat i still thought oh but well, this is great behavior anyway yeah but the the, the fox coming into frame gave it that three-dimensional feel and, and and intensity which i think is is you know, what, what, what got me in <laughs> absolutely yeah no it's a it's a fantastic image and, and definitely worth the uh, the recognition of uh, of the judges there so congratulations for that thank you thank and you. let's talk a little bit more because i know we've got loads of other photos we could look at um uh, so let's 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 do that and you know let's uh, talk a little bit about how, how this started because you mentioned that you know the foxes you can walk to the location where these foxes are is that the kind of thing that triggered you to start doing this was just the kind of the convenience factor of it um or, or was there something else that drew you to this <laughs> yeah it was it was buying my flat in tottenham where i live where these foxes uh, are, are living also and then having a mortgage and not having the funds for exotic foreign trips so i was forced to to turn my hand towards doing stuff close to home and 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 also kind of um in, enjoying that enjoying the challenge I, i'd done this book on vancouver island in 2011 and i was photographing bears whales and eagles and you know it, of course it was amazing megafauna you know sexy species this is a wildlife photographer's dream, but actually, technically, photographically, this is much more of a challenge, you know, much harder photographing these an animals at night. And I feel like at that time I, I needed that. Um, so I've been really learning over the last few years much more about how to use flash with animals, um, how to light the subject in a subtle way so it appears that the picture is naturally lit. There's nothing worse than completely blitzing uh, an animal with with mm. with flash, and it just looks unnatural and a bit kind of garish. So, you know, scenes like this, for example, you know, being a being a storyteller, which I guess is what photographers are these days, the communicators. You know, what what's going on? What you're trying to do with these pictures is gathering a range of images and giving it context. So, of course, we all know that London has lots of foxes. Showing this London bus going past, you know, without mm. the flash. You just don't see the fox so mm. i've really had to learn quite quickly i didn't really do much of it before 
this project and I've really enjoyed it, challenging myself to get you know very well lit um, pictures at night because they obviously they 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 are they are active in the day but they're definitely most active at night and I think that's where Absolutely. you get those interesting urban pictures. Absolutely, yeah, no, it's and and that that shot there. I, I always think flat. I, I don't like using flash in normal situations anyway. I always think it just drowns everything in in light and it looks harsh and it, it's very rare that I would prefer an image with flash on and I have it turned off. But what you've got um, in some of these images is that it's more subdued. It, it looks more like moonlight rather than a than a portable sun that's just um, drowning the poor thing. That's um, right. Yeah, and you can really control the. That's you know one of the one of the great things about the sophisticated technology. You know, I have two wireless flashes now so you know one will trigger the other i use soft boxes and small soft you know in the field soft boxes um, and and certain filters on the flash just really to dial that that power down um you know to give it that that soft softer lighting yeah. look you know and also particularly because there's so much white around the fox's face and and there's nothing worse than blown out highlights in in, mm. in any picture they're just very distracting so um yeah i've made hundreds of mistakes and and you get back home and you get frustrated and kick yourself that you got the settings wrong but you just take that information with you on the next shoot and and make sure you, you don't do it, on it. Yeah. yeah absolutely and you must find do you find the fox's behavior is something that drew you to them you know because you've mentioned that you know that they're running around darting all over the place they seem they're very active they're always doing something which i guess as a photographer must have been something that drew them to you in the first place yeah i think that as a kid growing up in london and loving animals loving wildlife i was always fascinated with foxes and do it's a thrill it's still you know i, I still have the same feeling when i see them even though i've been doing this for so long it's 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 exciting and i feel I really feel like championing urban wildlife now I kind of have a responsibility of, of, of doing it and being able to go and see this wild carnivore you know living among us and I think I think perhaps we get desensitized to it because we're just used to seeing foxes and a, a lot of people just think they're a nuisance I mean that's another mm. reason why I'm doing this project because I think this is an interesting animal this is really divisive it makes people blood boil or you have people that love them and want to feed them and see them and you know I've paid good money in the past to go and see bears in Alaska or lions in the Masai Mara and for me to be able to go up to this allotment for free like and, and often when there's no one else in there it's great I open the gate close the gate and, and I lock myself in and I feel like I'm in my own mini fox national park and you've got this <laughs> beautiful animal doing all sorts of behavior I mean this this image for example was great fun because I'd never seen a fox drink like this from one of these water troughs. So they have these water troughs dotted along the allotment edge where plot holders come and dunk their watering cans in to water their veg. And almost always they just jump up with their paws on the edge and, and lap it up. But this one, and in fact, this is the same fox two year, uh, a year later. Uh, this is the one that had the, the rat in its mouth, this vixen here. And she was drinking in this giraffe-like pose. I just, I heard her and I turned around and she looked right at me. So, it was, you know, and these are the kind of things that you're looking for when you're photographing is this type of behavior because mm. um, I've mentioned a lot, mostly they're just trotting around looking for earthworms make up a big part of their diet. You know, but I think contrary to what a lot of people think, these foxes are not eating rubbish like the whole time. Of course, they are resourceful and they do go through bins and, and eat our waste, but more than 50% of their diet is made up with natural foods. You know, they're eating wild birds. I've seen them catch and eat pigeons, obviously rats, um, small mice and voles um, and fruits. Yeah, I've seen them eat and that's why allotments make up a good portion of their diet. Not only are they digging for the earthworms, but they're looking for figs and um so yeah they they have a very they're a true you know a true uh omnivore even though they're you know sort of officially labeled as as carnivores they, they yeah. really have a varied diet absolutely well speaking of it we can see here um uh this this is the is this this is on the allotment uh i think we're, we're looking at here That's right um, yeah we've had a we've had a question come in um this is from angel um uh, they're asking what is the reaction of the allotment holders to the presence of the foxes because um, as you say, I think a lot of people do see them as a bit of a nuisance. Uh, have you seen how people react to them, especially when yeah. they're kind of frolicking around in the in the grass like that? It's a it's a it's a great question, and 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 you're quite right. 
mo most people um, are, are in, into the idea of it. I think most people, um, I think by the nature of having a, a plot where you're growing veg, you are engaged with nature, you need to learn about pollinators and, and, and I think overall, one who has a plot should be also respecting the wildlife around it that helps their vegetables to grow mm. but that's not always the case you've got some people on the on the allotment that really don't like them being there they you know they cause a lot of damage and digging up plants and and um you know pooing on their vegetables and and, yeah. and just tearing around and, and causing havoc and then also the rubbish that they drag in um it, it annoys people and and i understand it i do understand it but what i'm trying to do with this work is educate people and that's by just talking to people on the allotment also when i give presentations or or you know situations like this is that fundamentally i feel that foxes absolutely have a right to 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 live in these places you know just as much as as we do and they're not digging up your your garden to annoy you they're not bringing in rubbish because they want to make a mess they are just behaving like they're doing their thing yeah exactly yeah. and and the rubbish issue is not a fox issue that's a human issue um mm -hmm. um but yeah no it, it actually this year did get quite heated because two vixens had two lots of cubs so there were foxes like running right on 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 the allotment which of course i thought was hilarious <laughs> okay so you'd love that but yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe getting a bit stressed about it do you ever um so you mentioned that you you're, you're often shooting with the the long lens. Do you ever shoot um, with things like camera traps and stuff, and um, so you can kind of set something up and then go away, and then you see what you come to the next day? Yes. So I've used uh, not camera traps with my my DSLR cameras. Or I, I've done remote trigger photography. I haven't set something up and 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 left it to try and get really nice high end pictures. But I have used a trail cam. So. You know, just a, a a cheap night vision camera, just to see, you know, where uh, what's going on with the foxes. Um, I, I was able to see how many cubs the vixen had had this year because I set a trail cam up quite close to the den when they were only coming out at night. So all the flash photography, um, uh, not a night photography, uh, not all of it. Sorry, but there there are a certain selection of photographs i've taken where i've not been behind behind the camera but i use a little trigger called a pocket wizard where so i can stand away from the camera and wait for a, a fox to pass uh, or where I've, wherever i got it up in a certain setting i'm able to to trigger it but yeah i think that that's going to be the next thing for this year is exploring that um i think it's a, a fun technology to use and again you can get you know different different style pictures yeah they look, they look fantastic it's really interesting just seeing them in different settings and doing doing different things we've got another question uh this uh, comes in from andrea uh, they're asking does the flash scare the foxes yeah it's just it's, it's a good question and you know there's there, there's some purists that might will frown you know against photographers using flash well with, with all animals and you know my my feeling is you approach it gently um and sensitively in, in in the beginning i wouldn't go up to a fox that was comfortable around me and just put a camera in its face and flash it i would fire it a few times first and just observe see how comfortable they are around it and and um you know i feel like it's probably the least of their worries mm. they have cars you know driving around at night their headlights are, are much brighter than my flash um and no, I think by by approaching it sensitively. I mean, you know, if if a paper were to come out that says you know, flash is really damaging long term to you know Fox's vision, then I would reconsider without a doubt. Um, but I, I feel like my approach is 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 sensitive, and like I say, even though they're lit, the flash, the power itself is 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 very low, which is key to getting that that natural look that we were talking about, isn't it? Yes. Um, so it's sort of related to that. Another question, this one's from Sue. Um, do you have advice for using flash in a rural setting? We have no light pollution. It's difficult not to startle the subject. Yeah, that's a that's a, a, a really good question. And, and there will be photographers um, who do photograph countryside foxes that will be better placed to, to answer that question than me i mean i have i have no pictures of countryside foxes and i really commend the photographers that, that get those because um they're almost like a different species in the way that they behave mm -hmm. much more skittish much more flighty they don't have that boldness that an urban fox needs for survival 
Um, I think the question the question is 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 trying to find you know a route that they would walk along. Um, they are creatures of habit. They do patrol territories, and 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 setting something up there, and 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 the same approach really, just kind of introducing it um, slowly. And you know, it, it it might be. I th I think you know, in in the first instance, it would startle startle an animal. But if you were to do that every night, um, the fox would just get used to it and and recognize mm. it as as not a threat. But yeah, camera trap photography. A, a photographer once said to me, "It's ninety nine percent failure, so you have to really persevere with it." And um, and it's exciting, of course. You're going back to your camera after uh, it, it being out in the night and seeing what you've got. But be prepared to be disappointed. Ninety nine percent of the time. I was going to say, yeah, it can be demoralizing when you've got. <laughs> yeah. and there's, there's not really anything there. Um, but uh, perseverance, I think, is a theme for for photographers certainly. <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much, guys, for your questions. I know there's a few more. We'll, we will get to them uh, as soon as we can. Um, do the foxes, I wanted to ask if the foxes, you know, you don't use camera traps all the time. You do say you're, you're often there in the field. Do the foxes get used to your presence? Do they get comfortable? You know, as you say, if they get used to things like a flash going off every night, do they get used to you being there? Because certainly my experience with foxes is they don't seem to bat an eyelid when they see people walking about, the, the city foxes anyway. Yeah, so... Um, a lot of people have asked this question, you know, do I, have I used a hide on the allotment? And my approach was never to do that because the, the actual the area is quite small and they would see and smell and hear me in that hide. It would just be futile. So my approach is just to be there present the whole time and hope that they just get used to me and see me as not a threat. And maybe in my, in, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, that these foxes are just thinking, oh, here's the annoying guy, you know, with the camera again. Um, I don't feed them, so they don't see me as a, a source of food. So I just want them to go about their natural behaviour like they normally would. So I'm there just incidentally and, and, and able to, to capture that. Um, so they definitely know who I am, that's for sure, particularly the, the vixen. And the reason I know that is because I've, I've made the mistake in, in the beginning of taking one or two people in there with me just 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 to show them and, and to experience and one mm. of the first times i did we we approached the vixen you know slowly and she kind of looked up and was a bit more skittish and definitely not you know as as relaxed so you know they're bright animals and and they can tell my shape and 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 my smell i'm I, i'm absolutely convinced of that and some of the shots you've got are they're really intimate some of them and you know is that have you actually been able to get that close or are you actually half a mile away with a, <laughs> a long lens you know something like this i mean that's a beautiful shot so so peaceful you know that fox is clearly at ease in that moment yeah i mean this is this was an exceptional moment and a wonderful night i i this you know, the sun had just gone down so it was ambient light and this is this is the this is the vixen this is my dream fox really she if she you know she, i think almost all the con really really good content i've got over the last four years of, has been of her just because she's just been so brave around me this is also her as well and you know there there have been times where i've, I've been sitting there taking photos of her you know trotting around doing her thing looking for worms and then she'll just curl up and sleep and sometimes right next to me um like this so you know i would just quietly set up my tripod take some stills and, and this is when you have the luxury of being able to do both stills and video if an animal is not moving around too much so capturing this type of behavior both in stills and video is is such a treat but no other fox has allowed me to get so close and i, mm. I put that down to her experience and also that she's known me for four years that you know i feel you know very very lucky to have the, to have to have had these experiences absolutely did it surprise you that you know on your doorstep there was so many wonderful opportunities to get these beautiful wildlife shots yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah without a doubt um i now when i look back at, at, the, at the collection it's you know, I'm, I'm really proud of the work. It's, it's, it's very strong. Um, there are always more pictures to be had. I don't think you can ever really take the perfect picture, which is great because it just keeps you hungry 
for for taking more um and then you know different years bring different things even though you get used to certain habits and you know their mating times and you know when the cubs are going to be born this year for example where i took this picture um with the the vixen who i've known for four years these are her cubs from this spring i took this one i think it was in may and you can see an out of focus chicken wire fence in the background and they had dug underneath this uh, or she had and built her den um in a underneath a shed in the in the garden right next to the allotment and it was very accessible so i was able to take some really intimate video some 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 intimate portraits it's funny because she knew i was there but the cubs didn't you can see some leaves leaves in the foreground i was hiding i didn't want to spook the cubs um so early so i'm using a longer lens here she she would know that i'm there but you know this kind of thing i never got in the previous three years just because the dens were not so accessible so mm. You know, who knows, you know, she may not make it this year. Um, and then my, you know, the, my ability to get close, you know, I, I may have lost that. So it's li literally making hay while, while the sun shines. Yeah. Well, you're, you're certainly making the most of it and, um, you're getting some beautiful shots of, of completely natural behavior, either because the foxes aren't even aware you're there or they are and they're completely at ease so they they can behave naturally which is which is beautiful yeah we've got a few more questions coming in um let me um uh get some of these before before we move on so thank you very much guys for your questions do do keep them coming um this one is from jennifer uh jennifer asks how do you address the issue of some allotment holders using things like pesticides or slug pellets rat poison etc where others don't how do we educate people to use natural methods to protect our wildlife hedgehogs foxes etc and not interfere with the food chain so yeah i guess that you sort of touched a little bit on that when you said that some allotment owners really don't appreciate the foxes being around yeah and so how do, how do we deal with this <laughs> wow it's 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 a, it's a challenge and it it gives a great insight into land ownership as well you know people get very territorial about their plots. I mean, I have to say from the beginning, most people on the allotment, and it's a very beautiful uh, allotment, it's quite hidden. It was a disused railway, which is why you've seen some of those clips here, that long green pathway, uh, which used to be a railway line and either side are, are where all these plots are. Um, and there's uh, there's a guy called Viv who's become a good friend and he is really into the wildlife. He's actually got two ponds on his plot. Um, and I, I didn't know this uh, before, but slug pellets are, uh, are, can be harmful to to the frogs and and he's um, been he's had really successful um uh, uh, amount of frogs uh, li living on his ponds and so he is absolutely trying to do that most people are not using slug pellets which is good but there are some that still do and some that still do use pesticides so yeah it's a tricky one um there's a guy next to me who is really not a fan of the foxes and you know, how do you change their minds? And I think it's about not getting on your soapbox and wagging your finger, but mm -hmm. kind of trying to bring them along on the journey with you and say, oh, you know, hey, have you, you know, have you seen this? Or uh, I think that's one of the funny things about this rat picture is I think people that hate foxes, my guess is they probably hate rats too. So if you can tell them that, hey, well, look, you know, the, the foxes are doing a good job of keeping rodent populations in check, then they might think differently about you know wanting to get rid of foxes <laughs> yeah i think that's uh, i think your photos definitely have um the power to to show animals in a different light um and i think that you know you're not going to convince everyone but i think a lot of people will see them perhaps differently to how they they might see them when they're just you know walking past and seeing litter strewn all over the path and oh it's the foxes again and it's like as you say they're only doing what comes naturally to them um, and you're trying to document that and, and, and show that. Yeah. That's right. And I think, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a kind of uh, under any illusion that, you know, my work, which ultimately will become a book in, in, in about a year's time, I've, I've, I've teamed up with two other photographers. Um, you know, I mentioned about countryside foxes. So I've teamed up with Andy Parkinson, who's only got countryside foxes and, and Neil Aldridge, who, who are both winning photographers and wildlife photographer of the year. Neil's got some brilliant stuff around the hunt and kind of more photojournalist style of people and foxes. Um, so this work, and I, obviously I've got the urban coverage, so collectively our work is going to tell a comprehensive story about red foxes in the UK. And we've had lots of meetings and talked about, you know, what's the message going to be and what the story is going to be. And of course, no book's going to 
change everybody's attitudes but there are a lot of people that are on the fence and one of the things i've experienced is you do have quite a lot of you know left-leaning liberal people that are really into wildlife that they'll you know give money to wwf or, or greenpeace but they don't want foxes in their back garden and i find that fascinating you know and it's a, it's a little bit of nimbyism um but also i just think that they're you know that if you can change just a few hearts and minds then that's progress absolutely um now we've had a couple of questions come in um uh from some photographers i i imagine uh with some questions about the kit that you're using um and your sort of favorite lenses and things like that so could you maybe tell us a little bit about what what kind of equipment you're typically using um, sure. and you and you like to use on, on shoots like this sure yeah so i i i've been using canon for for 20 years um and uh i started off using a 300 millimeter fixed focus telephoto lens and quickly that that was actually not um because uh, you could get so close i didn't need that focal length so most of the sort of long lens stuff i've done with the 70 to 200 um you know having that that range is fine it's nice and light i can carry it around no problem uh, it's a really, really sharp lens as well, which is which is great and very fast. Um, and then I've also been using a 16 to 35 millimeter wide angle lens. So you see lots of the wide angle shots. There was one you showed earlier of a fox asleep in the foreground and all the nice urban setting in the background. And actually, that's my favorite lens. You know, if you can get close enough to a fox to be able to use a wide angle lens, it's just brilliant because it gives a different perspective. It's much better at showing. Yeah, here it is now. It's much better at showing the animal um, in its environment. And these mm. types of pictures, I, I, I feel like they have more depth to them. They have this uh, three dimensional feel and you can, this one tells a story, you see a car going past and all the street lights, the unbroken Victorian terrace. And you know, you think, what's this fox doing here? Like sleeping in, in the middle. Whereas a telephoto lens, you get that tunnel vision and, and you miss out all the background you don't get yeah no yeah different. and when we've seen a variety of the shots today which has been been really interesting because they, they they each have their own strengths and and and, and weaknesses don't they um, we've had another question this one's coming from youtube asking how much time you spend on a single shoot because a lot of the photographs obviously you seem to take them at dusk or, or at night you know are you pulling all nighters do you go out all night <laughs> or do you are you going out for a couple of hours in the evening and, and hoping you, you manage to find something it's usually the latter yeah i don't pull all nighters um i need my sleep <laughs> um i also i'm also conscious as well you know that uh, you're walking around a neighborhood with a camera so i think if i was still there at one two in the morning it would be you know you might raise some eyebrows yeah, yeah exactly so um I, over the years it's tended to be that i've done more of the night photography this time of year so as we're coming into winter um it, it's it, the, the foxes are out m much more in, in night earlier so that's uh that's easy and yeah it would be typically i'd go from anything from an hour to to three or four hours at, at the most and then you know in the summertime and the springtime on the allotment and um, the sun actually right in midsummer sets perfectly down at one end so you have this lovely long thin path obviously west facing facing so that's when you can get some really nice low light stuff and when the sun's setting quite late usually most of the plot holders have gone so again, it's just me and the foxes. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I would just go, you know, for smash and grab sessions, you know, I've, I've got a daughter, so I might need to put her to bed and I'd like quickly run up there for an hour. And, but most, most of the time, just to get into the groove, it's better to spend, you know, two, three hours um, and you just better your chances of, of getting good shots. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's, uh, I think good advice. I think any, almost with anything, you want to give yourself that focus bit of time, um, to, to really sink get into it and and hopefully yeah you get something uh, out of it that uh, gets you in something like WP wine and then the competition. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I know we've been talking about foxes loads today, but obviously your portfolio of work goes far beyond that. Now there's another part of London that you have uh, visited many times, uh, which some folk might know, Hampstead Heath, um, and we've got some of the images that you've taken from there. Um, let's we'll just we'll just play we'll play through some of these and maybe tell us a bit about you know what drew you to this part of London it's it's quite a famous part of London of course as well because I guess it, it feels quite wild um for a city yeah um, um 
this project started off the back end of um, finishing the, the book on Vancouver Island. So, you know, I came back from that that project having published my first book and it was, you know, it was a thrill and it was exciting and I really enjoyed the process of bookmaking. I think it's such a great way of telling a story and showing your work. And, and actually a photographer, friend and mentor of mine said, you know, this book will be your best portfolio. And Hampstead Heath was somewhere that I, I always loved visiting. I, my mum still lives in East Finchley where I grew up and we used to go there quite a lot as kids. Um, and then in between foreign trips, I would always go to the Heath just to practice and, and keep my eye in. And yeah, I was seeing like wildlife like this, kestrels quite regularly and thought that that's, you know, what an amazing story this is. You've got this beautiful raptor just living five kilometers from the city center. And this is when I thought about this this idea of urban wildlife and green spaces and how important they are for Londoners, but also how important they are for for wildlife, you know, from a, from literally from the bird's eye view, if you're looking down, Hampstead Heath looks like a great place to stop. There's water, shelter, ancient trees, you know, plenty of food. So interesting stuff is showing up there. And so I approached the city of London who own and run the Heath with this idea of doing a book uh, and they went for it. You know, photography you know, they didn't give me any money but what they did give me was access um so i got great access with their ecologists and trees officers and i just set about getting a whole range of pictures and and on this book i wanted to include people much more because at that time seven million people visited hampstead heath annually so you can't do a book about only the wildlife and the mm. landscapes and that story of how people uh, and, and wildlife um can connect was really important so I was you know doing all, all sorts of things going to great lengths of getting into the water in my wetsuit and taking low angle shots of, of grebes um, this one was uh, actually awarded in the British Wildlife Photography of the Awards uh, back in 2015 and this is a shot of a great crested grebe and its chick uh, in the men's swimming pond and to have this swimmer in the background just really illustrated how we can cohabit in these spaces you know and the swimmers respecting the wildlife mm the wildlife kind of going in and out of the swimmers and uh, this is really what I wanted to tell with this story is how important these green it was a celebration of the heath but also um, a kind of message to say look this this is well managed it's well run and there's respect between the the people and the wildlife and did that you, was did, did you find that became a theme in the work that it was this kind of interaction between humans and and nature and, and other animals yeah it did i didn't it didn't set out to be like that um but i as i as the project went went on and i realized that because i was more of a pure wildlife photographer and i grew up in an age where taking pictures of wilderness didn't include any people it was something that was out there that we you know that was wow that photographer has gone to that location isn't that special and that trend changed as i was you know getting better at photography that actually people wanted to see people in the picture that it was something that was accessible and of course mm. everywhere you turn somewhere like the heath you've got backdrops like this you know with these townhouses in the background and just a simple shot of a mallard you know mallards you know, sw swimming past so that connection and and i think it's also illustrated in how resourceful nature is um and 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 how it can eke out a living in these in these mm. small corners even i think that was shown or evident really in the pandemic that we've got even on a even on a balcony that was a really important green space for someone that might have been locked up or your back garden if you're lucky enough to have one your local park uh, these places became really important for us but of course they're hugely important for for wildlife and if you can have a nice undisturbed patch you'll find all sorts of stuff there so the heath book was really yeah a celebration of this amazing green space and the history of it and how close it is to the city centre and all the views, but also all the great wildlife that, that you can see there. And, and if managed well, if respected well enough, um, it's there for everyone to enjoy. It is. So yeah, if you haven't been to the Heath and you find yourself in London, go and have a visit. And you might be surprised at um, the wildlife you can find there. Um, so Matt, we're almost out of time, but I've got one last question uh, from one of our viewers that I want to ask you. Um, uh, this is, uh, they say, hi, I'm a wildlife photographer. I'm 14 years old. What would you suggest to me in order to improve my photography? <laughs> That's a, that could be a yeah. big question. Can you, well, can you sum that up in, yeah. um, in a minute? I think, I think the, the, the best way to improve your photography generally is to make life easy for yourself. And 
you know, pick one subject. You could, if you find a nice old tree, um, or it doesn't even necessarily have to be an old tree. I mean, usually older trees are, are more interesting in terms of texture and what's living on them. Um, and go and fo photograph that one tree and, and, and find different angles and experiment and don't be afraid, you know, just take lots and lots of pictures and you'll be amazed, you know, the subtle frame changes and making the picture lighter and darker. Um, well, you, it's much better than just taking one picture and moving on, one picture and moving on, because you only really scratch the surface. So my advice always is to just choose one location and stick at it. And that way you build up a body of work and you're continually moving forward. You know, don't take one or two pictures and then look back, but take 10, 20, 30 pictures of the same subject. And then you've got some substance. And then you have this sort of natural reaction. You can feel it in your stomach, you know, which ones work, which ones don't. And the ones that work, you ask yourself, how can I improve on this? You know, mm. can I compose this slightly differently to make it more impactful? What's in the background? You know, don't forget to think about what's behind the subject that you're photographing. Yeah, and then I no, look, I think as well, look at what's it, what else is out there. Um, you know, in, in National Geographic, BBC Wildlife, these these magazines are the sort of benchmark wildlife photographer of the year. Mm. What's working and why? And it can inspire you when you see good images. You think, I, I want to try and get something like that. That's that's yes. kind of what you what you're yeah, in for. And, and I, th I think if you're if as you say if you're if you're going to the same place and it's it's close to you, like like we had with the heath that we just looked at or um, the foxes earlier, you're you're able to easily keep going back again and again and again and again and again and that's going to help you see your improvement i suppose because you're photographing the same things each time yeah and then you get more comfortable with the, the the lay of the land and where the light falls and particularly you know in in what i think we're really lucky where we live because the seasons are so drastically different you know every three months we have this big change and um, that is exciting visually. So trying to capture that on camera, doing something as simple as, you know, that one tree that you photograph, photograph it throughout the seasons and mm. um, building up a body of work and, and telling a story around it. I always think it's like a painter doing a study. You know, when you see a grand piece of work in, in, in the Tate or the Royal Academy, that one picture or that one painting is the result of lots and lots of work and studies. And I think that's, what photographers really ought to do a good way of approaching our work is to is to study and to, mm. just to keep keep photographing and yeah like i said you're never going to get that perfect image but um you can make progress trying keep trying excellent well yeah. we've run out of time i'm afraid matt but thank you so much for i think that's some really good advice uh, for our photographer budding young photographers out there and um hopefully you've inspired a few people to go out to their local area and um and start shooting and getting getting those uh future competition winning photos in there so uh, <laughs> thank you very much for that before you go do you have any um uh can people access your work anywhere do you have websites are you on yeah social media? absolutely so my website is just simply my name matthew moran.com that's m-a-r-a-n um i'm most active on instagram both instagram and twitter is the same at man at matt moran photo and um yeah, for people interested in, in in learning more, if they want to come on a workshop with me, I, I run workshops on Hampstead Heath. Actually, I do these one day workshops I've been running for six years, and and I've also I also host a podcast, which are completely free, and I've interviewed some of the best other photographers um, in in the world. So yeah, there's lots of stuff on my website, and yeah, we can continue the the conversation uh, through social media channels. So Great. yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, well, it's been a pleasure, Matt. Thanks so much for talking and um, all the best uh, for your, your future work. I hope uh, I hope the book's a, a huge success when it does come out. Thank you so much. Great. Take care. Bye now. And thank you guys very much for joining us and for all your questions. Sorry if we didn't get uh, through all of them, but thank you very much for sending them through. Uh, it's been great uh, to answer them. And uh, thanks again to Matt for joining us. If you want to see more wonderful photos from the natural world, including Matt's winning photo that we looked at uh, earlier, uh, then you can visit the Wildlife Photographer of the Year uh, exhibition. It is now open at the Natural History Museum in London. But if you can't make it to the museum in person, you can view the photos online through the museum's website. But thank you very much for joining us today. And we'll see you again for our next episode very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you.